Hello and welcome to the Food Freedom Podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Food Freedom Coach, and I'm really excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. So how are you all doing? I hope that you're surviving okay in lockdown and that you and your families are staying well. I don't know about you, but I think that this period can be quite an emotional roller coaster. There are parts of lockdown that I've really enjoyed and I'm really fortunate to be with my family and it's definitely allowed us a lot more bonding time and mostly we've got on well. We're more relaxed as well and getting more sleep and it's so nice not to be tearing around everywhere all the time. On the other hand though, it can definitely be intense at times and emotions can run high. Feeling too much in each other's space and feeling increasingly irritated over the smallest things, such as someone slurping their cornflakes too loudly or being in your personal space. I know though that really these things are minor when you have your health and thank goodness as well for the sunshine in the main. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the last three guest interviews on this podcast. I know these episodes have been incredibly popular and just to let you know, there are more guests lined up to be coming over the following weeks. So do stay stay tuned. (laughs) But today it's just me and I'm going to be talking all about intuitive eating and particularly my thoughts on this in how this can be embraced when you're overcoming an eating disorder or disordered eating. So intuitive eating, what is it? It gets banded around a lot at the moment on social media. You know, you've probably heard quite a lot about it. So with intuitive eating, it's really encouraging you to listen to your natural hunger and to respond to it. So you eat when you're hungry, you stop when you're full. It being the complete opposite of dieting, which is often dominated by restrictive rules on different food types or quantities or calories. And it also promotes a healthy attitude to food and body image. And doesn't it just sound so simple, natural and instinctual, just like breathing in and out. So yes, it sounds so simple, but sadly, it's something that many of us have forgotten how to do. We don't trust our bodies. We don't listen to our body signals. Instead, we hear the shoulds and the regulations that keep our appetites in check. Now, as a little baby, your hunger cues would certainly have been intuitive and hopefully with the right care and attention, you received the food you needed when you were hungry. But as you grew up through receiving external messages from family, friends and the culture, these all might have contributed to distorting your ability to be able to listen to your body. So as a child, you might have heard, you know, eat all the food on your plate if you want dessert. You can't be hungry, you've only just eaten dinner. You've hurt yourself, have a sweetie to feel better. And maybe as a teenager or young adult, you've put on a few pounds, why not come to the diet club with me? You're greedy for wanting that. I've made you a cake to cheer you up. So to begin to eat intuitively, we need to distance ourselves from these messages and begin to tune in to our physical and emotional hungers. So what do I mean by that? So physical hunger is when your body is telling you that you need to eat. So you might experience a rumbling stomach, tiredness, irritability and food preoccupation. Everyone's signals are going to be slightly different. And when you satisfy physical hunger, these signs disappear as you have met your body's biological need for food. And secondly, emotional hunger. So when you turn to food, not out of hunger, but rather an emotional need. This is often experienced as a craving where you experience a strong desire for the food, even if not biologically hungry. Beneath the craving, you might feel angry, anxious or sad, and you may have temporarily learned to soothe these feelings through eating. So early influences of an intuitive eating style include Thelma Whaler, Janine Roth, and Susie Orbach. However, it was cemented as an official philosophy of eating in 1995 by the dietitians Evelyn Tribal 
and Elise Reich, who created 10 intuitive eating principles. So I'm going to talk about these principles with a particular interest in how to embrace them when overcoming an eating disorder or disordered eating. So number one is reject the diet mentality. Now, if you've struggled with disordered eating, then dieting might have almost become a norm and a given. This might be the more traditional dieting, maybe through having shakes or like a very restricted meal plan, or it might be clean eating or cutting out carbohydrates or delaying eating or trying to eat super healthily, but in reality, very restrictively. So it covers the whole spectrum. Now, rejecting dieting is hard because you'll be exposed to numerous triggers daily that may have almost become a normal. And this can be in so many different ways. So it might be like people talking at work about their latest diet and kind of, you know, talking about what they're going to be eating that day and you feeling very triggered by that conversation. It might be scrolling through social media and seeing incredibly lean influences promoting their restrictive plan or some kind of product. It might be looking at eating disorder accounts where people are clearly struggling, but you're kind of getting drawn back into looking at them. It might be watching TV programs about losing weight or promoting weight loss as a good thing. It might be reading articles in magazines that promote an unhealthy practice around food. And there are so many articles out there which are not based on research. Now my client, Jane, made up client, had been a serial dieter for many years. She had a library of diet books, a cupboard full of shakes and supplements, and she regularly rejoined different dieting groups. It had almost become a hobby and way of life. It was a radical decision to throw out the dieting. It wasn't easy, so it was a bit like moving away from a religious belief that she'd been following and suddenly she was trying to adopt new beliefs. So it felt really uncomfortable and it felt really unnatural. So she started out by unfollowing the dieting accounts that she was sort of following regularly on social media. She threw out her old dieting books and she put some boundaries in place for people who were triggering her with their diet talk. Now it wasn't an overnight transformation. The dieting world would keep seducing her back again and again and it took several months to properly untangle from the dieting world. So think about what this would mean for you to start to reject the diet mentality. What would you need to do to properly start to reject diet culture? Because if you really want to embrace intuitive eating, you can't continue to have a foot in each camp because you're gonna get yourself in a muddle because you can't do both. You're gonna be conflicted. Okay, number two, honoring your hunger. Now, if you've had an eating disorder, honoring your hunger might be almost alien. You might have become used to almost liking your hunger and feeling that this is a comfort and sign that you're doing the right thing. And you might also find it incredibly difficult to even trust your hunger. You might feel that it's an uncontrollable beast that can't be tamed. And you might be terrified to begin to listen to it again. Now, if you're under eating and restricting your food, or binge eating or overeating, your hunger signals might be completely out of sync. And you might be used to only eating when you're completely starving or eating when you know that you're not hungry but you just can't stop. So it's going to take some time for hunger levels to be restored and to be able to trust them again. And when you first start to listen more to your body, you're not going to get it perfectly right straight away. It's going to be a gradual process of retuning and listening to that biological need to eat. Now, a big criticism of intuitive eating is often, well, I'll just end up eating rubbish all the time if I honour my hunger. Now, in reality, if you've been denying yourself certain foods for a long time, when you finally allow yourself to eat them again, you're going to want to eat more of them. This is a natural consequence of deprivation. However, this phase will pass, but you will have to hang on in there to get through this. And there's some things that you can do as well to help you get through this much better. So firstly, you can ensure that you keep your body 
biologically fed with adequate energy and carbohydrates. Without this, you will trigger a primal desire to overeat, which will render intuitive eating almost impossible. So this means eating regularly, so you don't reach crazy hunger levels. This means three meals and three snacks per day and structuring your eating. You might argue that this isn't purely intuitive eating, and it's not. However, to get to an intuitive eating place when you've had disordered eating, you will need some structure and planning to help your body get back on track. And it also means trying to eat from all the food groups, ensuring that you include protein, slow-release carbohydrates and good fats in adequate amounts at each meal time. And if you don't eat enough or go for long periods without eating, when you do eat, you're highly at risk of binge eating or overeating. And it's so hard then to find that balanced middle ground where you are more in tune with your body. So think about what do you need to do to begin to honour your hunger? What would be the first steps to this? Okay, moving on to principle number three, making peace with food. Doesn't that sound great? So this means that no food is forbidden. So if you've had an eating disorder, this can be so challenging. So you've probably got a whole load of rules around your eating. It might be related to timings. For example, I can't eat past 6 p.m. Or types of foods, I mustn't eat white carbs. Or you may feel stuck with eating the same foods every single day and not deviating from the safety of these. So giving yourself unconditional permission to eat any food can be terrifying. And you might also, if you've had disordered eating, you probably only allow yourself to eat certain foods in a binge or when you're out of control with eating, but by no means do you genuinely permit these foods in. So having unconditional permission to eat can feel so challenging. It can feel a bit like jumping off a platform to do a bungee jump and feeling completely unsafe and terrified by what's below. So if you've had an eating disorder, you might want to permit foods back in gradually rather than in all one go. The end goal is unconditional permission to eat any food, but maybe you need some stepping stones to get to this. Now I know myself, I used to feel very unsafe around donuts or croissants or pastries. These foods felt like binge foods and I didn't feel that I'd be able to stop at one. Hence, I used to avoid them. So to try to make peace in eating these foods, I really started small and I bought individual pan au chocolats at first. So in this instance, I was genuinely permitting them back in, but I was also managing my portion size so that it felt safe. So I repeated this many times before I then bought a pack of six in one go. So by the time I did this, I'd become used to eating these pastries and they weren't so special or alluring anymore. They'd become a regular food in my eating repertoire. So once I felt really comfortable with these, I then moved on to thinking about another fear food and regularly challenging myself to begin to expand my foods eaten to the point now where I can pretty much eat anything. And the only foods I would avoid now are the ones I don't like the taste of. So say, for example, something like baked beans, but it's nothing to do with like calories or something being forbidden. So think for yourself, what would it mean for you to start making peace with food? How could you begin to reintroduce some foods that have been forbidden? And how could you do that in a safe way? Okay, moving on to the next principle is challenging the food police. Now, I think as well that this is quite linked to my previous principle, my previous principle, the intuitive eating principles. So this is all about challenging the judgment in your head that some foods are either good or bad. Now, judgment we know induces guilt and shame, which encourages restriction and paradoxically further overeating. So if you feel bad for overeating, you might punish yourself by eating more. You might feel powerless to change your eating behaviour, so hence you self-sabotage. So the food police are often the internalised voices in your head from the culture, from family, from friends and from life experiences. 
And I'm thinking of another client I've worked with in the past whose mother would regularly berate her and criticise her in relation to her body shape. Now this was as an adult as well. She'd have done it as a child and also as my client was an adult too. Now my client had almost accepted that this was the norm. She hadn't really questioned just how toxic and relentless these comments were. And she almost felt that she deserved them. And she didn't feel that she could have a barrier up to protect herself. The voice was so internalised. You know, she felt shame and guilt for not just losing weight and sorting herself out. So she would end up massively rebelling against the voice in her head through eating more. Outwardly to her mum, she seemed to be quite pleasing and accommodating and she didn't really express how angry and upset she felt by those comments. But she would really then take it out on herself and rebel against these kind of shoulds and the kind of food police in her head. So being criticised or judged about your eating, even if, even if this is by your own inner voice, it's not going to motivate you to change and have a healthy relationship with food. It will bring out your inner rebel. It will bring out the part of you that feels hopeless to change. So the alternative is to begin to develop greater self-compassion, support and kindness toward yourself. And not just around your eating, but around everything. It's thinking much more about how you would talk to a friend. How would you support a child who is, you wanted to have a healthy relationship with food? And then applying that to yourself. Moving on to the fifth principle, respecting your fullness. So this is about listening to your body and beginning to recognise feelings of fullness. And to do this, you might really need to slow down your eating and tune into your body's physical sensations. Now, if you've had an eating disorder, feeling full can feel downright wrong. Feeling full can induce panic and guilt as though you've committed a crime. And you might even be in an unhelpful pattern of purging when you feel too full. So you're going to need to learn to tolerate the anxiety that you will initially feel from feeling full. And you might need to distract yourself or have a good friend or family member nearby to help support you through this. So to begin with, this might be very challenging. If you've been under eating, you're going to feel full very quickly. You might even experience some IBS type symptoms as your digestive system recovers. And this can be confusing as experiencing pain might put you off from eating. Again, this is a temporary phase that you will need to go through. If you regularly overeat or binge, you probably often go to fullness levels that are way beyond feeling nicely satisfied. You might eat to the point of feeling just really uncomfortably full and bloated. So you're probably going to need to slow your eating right down so you have time to tune into your body. And to help with doing this as well, it's best not to get over hungry before you eat. Otherwise, you'll not want to slow down because you'll be starving and understandably wanting to get the food inside you ASAP. When you're trying to get more comfortable with fullness as well, try not to focus overly on your stomach. Um, as And also, if you start to think about your different rules about if you should or you shouldn't feel full, this can get in the way of you actually tuning into your body and feeling your fullness. So it's about slowing down, listening to your body and finding that place where you feel comfortably full but not too, too stuffed. And it's going to take some practice. Interestingly, in my own recovery, it was strangely pleasant to actually feel full and satisfied rather than eating and then constantly dealing with gnawing hunger. It was actually quite a relief to be able to eat and for food preoccupation to lessen a little. So everyone's experience is going to be different though. And it's going to be an imperfect process of getting comfortable with your fullness and being able to trust your fullness. So, you know, give it a go and see what happens for you. Moving on to principle number six, discover the satisfaction factor. So in our drive to be healthy or thin, we often miss one of the most basic gifts of existence, the pleasure derived from the eating experience. Eating foods that you truly enjoy ensures that the yum yum factor is attained and satisfaction is more likely achieved without overeating. 
So guess what everyone? Food is meant to be a pleasure. Something that we enjoy and derive happiness from. Yes, you don't want it to be your number one and only pleasure that you rely on to lift mood or to be the pinnacle of your day, but you want it to be there in its place. Now, if you've had an eating disorder, then food may have completely lost its pleasure factor. Food has become all about deprivation or guilt or judgment. You might also be stuck in a rut of eating particular foods because you think that you should eat them, when in fact you don't really enjoy these foods. You're missing out on the necessary yum yum that we all get from eating. So I remember my client Zoe. She'd eaten clean for two years solid. This meant tons of green vegetables, smoothies, fruit, lean protein, and that was pretty much it. But about once a month or more, Zoe would have an absolutely massive binge on all the foods that she would view as completely unclean foods. And this was because, although she liked healthy food, the eating plan she was following was way too strict. It was way too limited and it was missing out on that ultimate satisfaction factor. So think about the foods that genuinely bring you joy and you find really delicious. So these are some of the things that I really enjoy. I really love a roast dinner with all the trimmings. I love dark chocolate with licorice tea. I like a chocolate twist with like a hot cup of coffee. And I really like chorizo pasta with like pasta and spicy sauce. So you get my drift. Think about your own eating and how are you doing for your pleasure and satisfaction levels at the moment? Are you including enough of that yum yum factor? And if you find that you're often overeating or binge eating, it might be because you're missing this vital ingredient. So moving on to the next one, number seven, honoring your feelings without using food. Now, of course, being a therapist, this is naturally one of my favorite principles. Now, difficult emotions are part of life and food cannot fix these feelings. It may soothe you temporarily, but long-term it's going to create further problems. Instead, you need to find ways to comfort, distract and problem solve without using food to do this. Now, if you've dieted a lot, food can often become the number one way to comfort or self-soothe. And if you've experienced any trauma, neglect or difficult circumstances in your life, this can make your relationship with food quite complicated, as food has often become then more than simple nourishment. If you struggle to name your emotions and have healthy outlets for them, then food can easily fill this void, as can alcohol, drugs, shopping, or lots of other things. So to start to honor your feelings without using food, you could start to write a journal and write down how you're feeling to be able to get in tune with your emotions. You can notice when you're journaling, when you turn to food, and try to join the dots to understand what's triggering this. Now this can be hard because if you're not used to doing it, you might find it really hard even to begin to think about how you're feeling. Um, And sometimes this is where therapy can be really helpful and supportive in this process. But some of the common examples when we can turn to food when it's more an emotional need are one, stuffing down anger, when you feel you can't safely express this. A bit Like earlier when the client I talked about who couldn't express her feelings safely with her mother, she was often stuffing down her anger with food. Another one is eating when you're bored, when you don't have structure and purpose. So mindlessly going to the cupboard and using food to stimulate and fill your day. And another one's using food to soothe anxiety when you feel overwhelmed or you don't have another outlet for food. So have a reflect and just really think about when do you turn to food when actually what you're needing to do is to meet an emotional need. And if you're not really sure about that, writing things down, using a journal, it could be the first step towards this. Moving on to the next principle, respecting your body. Now again, being a therapist, this is one of my favorites. So this is hard. is working on accepting your body type. We're all different shapes and sizes and our genetic blueprint plays an important part in this. Our body shape is pretty much 70% genetics. In the same way that we can't change our hair color or our shoe size, our genetics do play an important role. Now, 
diet culture often just tells us, you know, you just need to work harder, diet more, exercise more, and you'll have the sculpted body of your dreams. Now, this just ain't true. Of course, exercising, eating well, you can do lots of really positive things for your body, but you're not going to suddenly change your genetics. So if you have genes for a boyish figure, you can't suddenly become an hourglass. And I know I'm pear-shaped and even a mad crazy diet isn't going to leave me with a different shaped body. I'm just going to end up with very flat chest and probably regular sized thighs. So that's just kind of how it is. So this is hard to get your head around. A radical acceptance of your body shape is needed. But actually, once you can accept that, it places you in a much better place to work with your body and to appreciate it more. And there will, will ugh, cannot speak. There will be some bits that you can be much more accepting of as well, and it's important to focus on these. Your body is also really quite incredible, and we have amazing physiology. You don't have to suddenly love your body, but appreciating what it can do and offering it the minimum of some acceptance and respect is a good starting point. So taking active steps as well to show your body respect and appreciation is helpful rather than waiting to feel like doing it. The act of doing will then, will then create helpful thoughts and feelings that will encourage you to do more respectful acts. So act, don't wait to feel that you want to treat your body better. And it's really tricky to re reject dieting if you're unrealistic and overly critical about your body shape. So yeah, that can kind of keep you caught if you're still kind of hanging on there with dieting. Okay, moving on to number nine, exercise to feel the difference. So this is about exercising for the joy of movement and the benefits to your physical and mental well-being. Forget obsessive workouts or exercise motivated only by weight loss. So this is talking about actually enjoying exercise, not doing the relentless workouts or just exercising to lose weight or burn calories. This is about exercising for mental health, so for improved sleep, decreased anxiety, improved mood and body image. So if you've been caught in a pattern of over-exercising, you might actually have to leave the gym or the old ways that, we, that you were using to exercise that are strongly linked in your mind to using exercise for weight loss. And it can be a bit of a process to find pleasure in the joy of movement. Um, and also as well, what can help with this is trying to do something that can be social and fun too. So maybe it's dance or pole dancing or walking in nature or swimming or rock climbing. The list is endless and there is no right or wrong exercise here. And it's more about your relationship with it than the actual exercise itself. So think about yourself and think about your own relationship with exercise right now. Do you have a healthy relationship with exercise? Would it be helpful to make some little shifts to be able to move more for the joy of movement rather than it being a should or related to weight loss? And the final principle is about honoring your health. So this is about working to make food choices that honor your taste buds and your health, so op optimizing well-being. You don't have to eat a perfect diet to achieve health. Rather, the bigger picture of how you eat consistently is key. So if you look at centenarians, you know, those folks that lived to up to 100, over 100, guess what? They're not counting their steps or eating a perfect food plan. They value their health, but in a much broader picture. So yes, they don't tend to be excessive with any particular food or activity. They have a balance and they eat well, but they eat for pleasure and enjoyment also. Social connections always come out as the major factor in helping them live long and happy lives. And this involves social eating too and spending more time with loved ones. So when you genuinely honour your health, you don't want to eat donuts all day every day either. Your body will let you know that it's had enough and wants something a bit fresher. And you may initially go through a phase of eating more unhealthily, particularly if you've deprived yourself of these foods for a very long time, but this is a temporary phase and you will come through it. And I can say this because I know it's something I personally experience. 
And in the same way that you trust your body to know when to pee, or when to breathe, and you're in tune with those signals, hopefully, you can trust those. Again, it's possible to also get back in touch with your hunger and begin to trust your body again. So if you would really like to begin to eat more intuitively, be patient and kind with yourself in this process. You know, it may take time to reconnect and trust your hunger signals and to work with your body. So have a ponder and reflect on these 10 intuitive eating principles and think about what's relevant for you. Moving towards intuitive eating is a gradual process and it isn't something you're gonna suddenly nail overnight. So you need to be really patient and kind with yourself and take it one step at a time. And maybe as well, don't try and do everything at once. Think about which principle is a starting point for you and begin there. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode and good luck with taking some steps towards intuitive eating. Now, if you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the Food Freedom Coach. And for regular tips and insights into overcoming disordered eating, do sign up for my weekly articles on my blog page at foodfreedomcoach.co.uk. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.